Yeah, just wanted to give a, a quick intro to everyone and welcome you to our third webinar of the Crypto Market Intelligence webinar series. Uh, basically, DDA releases a monthly research paper called Crypto Market Intelligence, CMI, where we look back at what happened during the month in crypto, in macro, and, and on-chain. Uh, yeah, quickly introducing us, but uh, first and foremost, the, the legal disclaimer. Uh, first, as uh, you are probably aware that this is necessary, what we discuss here, that uh, is no legal advice and everything that is presented as purely informational purposes it doesn't constitute investment advice or recommendation or solicitation to buy any securities. I'm here with Andre today. He's our head of research. Uh, my name is Dominic Poiger. I'm the chief product officer at DDA and we'll cover a couple of uh, angles today, but uh, I won't say too much. So yeah, Andre, um, uh, we looked into valuations, into seasonality and, and sentiment in the CMI this month um, without much from my side to add. Um, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you and uh, hope you show us what you've, what you've prepared and, and then, yeah, happy to discuss uh, anything. Like I said, uh, we're, we're private, uh, pretty <laughs> intimate session today. Um, so yeah. feel free to, to interact with us as much as you want and can. Um, and yeah, we're really happy to uh, answer your questions, whether you post them in the in the Q and A section, um, or reach out to us after the mm -hmm. after the webinar. So yeah, Andre, sorry to keep on babbling. Go ahead. No, that's that's perfectly fine. So yeah, thank you very much. So very warm welcome from my side as well. My name is Andre Dragos. I'm head of research at Deutsche Digital Assets and. As uh, Dominic has mentioned, we will talk about seasonality, but of course we will talk about um, the big picture as well, talking about sentiment, valuation, so more like the crypto market intelligence content that we do monthly. So just to give you a broad overview, and then our idea is to dive into the seasonality stuff. But before I deep dive into the slides, I have basically three key takeaways. So first is, um, if we look at sentiment and valuations, there's actually no sign of short-term exuberance in the market, neither in terms of sentiment nor in terms of valuations. Valuations both for Bitcoin and Ethereum, the biggest crypto assets are still fair, so uh, around the 50 and 60 percentile. After this 80 percent rally this year, um, but we do think that the bottom is most likely behind us and um, the market is actually starting to price in the halving, at least for Bitcoin. And also the macro side provides some kind of tailwind. The second key takeaway from today is basically um, seasonal performance patterns suggest, suggest that Bitcoin is still dominated by human routine, despite the fact that it's actually being traded 24 seven, 365. So it's being traded all the time, but uh, there is some evidence that uh, on an hourly basis, monthly basis, and even daily basis, we have some kind of yeah reoccurring patterns uh, in the performance data. And talk about the um, hourly, daily, and monthly performance pattern. The third key takeaway is: so if you look at hourly data, you should favor London and New York sessions for trading because you have above average returns in these sessions in contrast to the Asian session early in the morning. If you look at daily data, you should favor the start of the week, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, in contrast to weekends where we see um, below average returns for Bitcoin. And if you look at monthly data, you should favor months outside of the holiday season, the summer season, uh, and especially August and September are the worst months Yeah, where, where we even have uh, on average, negative performances for Bitcoin uh, on a historical basis. But yeah, let's deep dive into the slides. So you know these uh, performance slides as well. Year to date on the left-hand side. I mean, uh, despite the recent correction, I've mentioned we had like 80% um, year to date performance before that correction. We still have above 60% for Bitcoin and even above 50% for Ethereum. And we still have outperformed any other major asset class this year. 
So that's the main uh, key takeaway here. And despite this rally, uh, so above 60% for Bitcoin and uh, about 50% for Ethereum, sentiment is rather neutral. Yeah. Um, so we have this kind of uh, crypto sentiment index that we um, calculate in-house. And it comprises of these 15 indicators. You've probably come across this if you read our weekly newsletter, the crypto market pulse. And what it essentially says is, so we had this dip due to the recent um, inscription saga and because of the congestion of the Bitcoin network was a big issue. A fee spike to, I think was $45 max per transaction. It has now come come down again. It's, I think it was it's now four four dollars per transaction. So it has significantly reversed again. But this caused some kind of uncertainty in the market. Um, and still, yeah, we are slightly pessimistic, more more neutralish at the moment. So there's no sign of yeah some kind of exuberance in the market. And the same can actually be said for valuations. So if we look at Bitcoin, but the same is actually true for Ethereum. If we look at Bitcoin and uh, look at all kinds of valuation metrics combined, uh, then we have to say, yeah, Bitcoin valuations are yeah, more or less fair at the moment, despite the rally. So we are talking about the 50 percentile uh, of average valuations of these indicators that you see here on the right hand side. Of course, there are some indicators that are that imply some kind of high valuations, but others imply low valuations. For instance, network value multiple, which is the active addresses squared, um, it still implies the it still implies high valuation. But on the other hand, if you look at, for instance, marginal cost of production, we are still trading below marginal cost of production for Bitcoin, and taking uh, taking everything together we are around fairish neutral valuation levels despite this rally. So compared to previous peaks, for instance, if you look at the previous peak in May or even November 2021, we are still far away from these high valuation levels. So that's the key takeaway. And like I've mentioned before, we, we still think that the cycle boredom is most likely behind us. And if uh, what we do at Deutsche Digital Assets also, we calculate some kind of um, bottom probability based on four different models. So four different algorithms, basically. Random, random forest, conditional tree, probit, logit model. And these models started to spike last year in November. They indicated some kind of bottom. I think the random forest model went to 12% and we even published an espresso on this. Crypto espresso, but it recently uh, another model, conditional tree model, recently spiked to 100% bottom probabilities. And these models are based on various valuation indicators as well. And um, yeah, so the key takeaway is that the bottom is most likely behind us, even from a statistical point of view. And if you consider the last three bear market cycles and the cycle drawdowns here on the right-hand side. So the yellow line is the current cycle and the other ones are the previous three cycles. So we're looking at all history that we have available and we're actually kind of tracking the median path of all the last three cycles. So our expectation is that we don't make new lows. We rather move up a little bit from here. We tend to, we'll probably move sideways but according to this, this kind of pattern, yeah, this kind of performance pattern during bear markets, you could expect new all-time highs by October, 2024. So one and a half years after the next halving, which is scheduled to take place, I think in April, 2024 for Bitcoin, it's quite likely that we see new all-time highs, but this is based on previous cycles only. So the previous yeah. performance pattern. So you have a question or you have a remark, Dominic? Yeah, I, I like these charts <laughs> because they are um, they look super intuitive. And mm. um, uh, I, I mean, working in this industry, um, 
we we know which cycles you are you are referring to but why um why do you think it is that that bitcoin or crypto assets follow such a path and how reliable do you think um such a model is when uh, when you look at price um, price performance going forward or until the next halving let's say yeah maybe it's some kind of self fulfilling prophecy but i think the next chart explains it very well on the left hand side i think we i don't know whether i've shown this before at least in this webinar but so stock to flow model we talk about this very very often in the bitcoin space right and it's some kind of equilibrium price model based on scarcity which is um, shown by the stock to flow ratio stock to flow means the current circulation of bitcoins divided by the annual production rate and it's around 60 years at the moment so it takes 60 years of current bitcoin mining mining production to replicate the current supply and you have phases of overshooting and undershooting of this equilibrium price, right? And equilibrium um, because model price. <laughs> equilibrium model price. So, and um, what these, what you mentioned was, um, why do you have these cycles, right? Why do they? Uh, why are they so similar, right? And maybe, uh, at least there's a theory. So you have the supply shock after halvings, the structural supply shock. For instance, we now have um, $900 million um, uh, dollars in Bitcoin that is mined uh, every day, I think. And this number will be half by 400, so 450 million in April 2024, when the next halving is scheduled. And this considers a permanent supply shock, right? So every... Um, every month you have this kind or every day you have the supply shock that accumulates over time right this is just per day but it accumulates over time and it reduces cell pressure structurally by minus so you find a new equilibrium but maybe the price reaction the initial price reaction enforces like and um, enforces even more investors to come in and like a self fulfilling prophecy that leads to this overshoot, right? That leads to this overshoot of the equilibrium model price, which is the fair value, basically. And so it needs to correct. And then you have the undershoot in the other way around. And what I'm trying to say is um, it, it, it's quite similar. The pattern is similar because the algorithm itself and the supply is pretty much determined, right? We know it until the year 20, uh, 2140, how much Bitcoin will be mined with a high degree of certainty, right? But what we don't know is demand. Demand is quite volatile and it's quite flexible. So yeah, I think these cycles, they, are, yeah, they, they come because of, um, they're generated because of these supply shocks mm -hmm. that, lead to these overshoots, but at the same time, um, these undershoots as well, be, be, uh, like a mean reversion to the equilibrium, to the fair value, you know, based on scarcity, ultimately. I mean, in, in all fairness, the, the stock to flow model um, has had its fair share of criticism over the mm -hmm. last two years, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. Have you checked how it holds up versus comparable assets like hard assets like gold and let's say real estate or um I mean, I mean obviously the supply isn't as inelastic as as for bitcoin or the, the total supply so mm -hmm. it's probably hard to compare it, but in terms of adoption and um and market readiness it's probably um fair to take other hard asset classes and and take them into the stock to flow you mean the, uh, you're probably referring to the cross asset yes. stock to flow model exactly i mean that was the i think the second model that was developed by plan b the original author of, of the stock to flow model right but I, i've checked it as well and you get even more extreme price forecasts than based on the uh 
uh, simple stock to flow model alone, right? But it's very super sensitive to what kind of assets you include in the model. Do you include copper, you know, which has awesome kind, kind of scarcity? Do you include silver, gold, or any other kinds of uh, assets? Because you only have a few data points, right? That's why it's so sensitive to any changes in, in the in the scatter plot, right? When when you come up with this kind of equilibrium model based on other assets, gas T, stock to flow ratio. And that's why I'm not, yeah, I'm not such a fan of the cross asset stock to flow model because it's so sensitive. And you only have very few data points. I mean, what's the scarcity? What's the stock to flow ratio of real estate? Very hard to determine, right? It's maybe it's easy to determine on the national level, but it's, it's hard to determine on a global level if you compare like to a global asset like Bitcoin or Ethereum. It is a global decentralized asset that's yeah. being traded 24-7, 365 yeah. in Asia, Europe, and uh, Americas. Therefore, it's really hard actually um, yeah, to determine this. Yeah, also in terms um, of uh, price um, transparency, right? I mean, there's one Bitcoin yeah. price, but there's not like a skyscraper in Beijing is probably more, yeah. uh, uh, it has a different price than a, than a skyscraper in wherever. Yes. <laughs> to totally. And at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, you only have so few data points. Like, for instance, you calculate stock to flow ratio for US real estate, but you don't get so many data points on annual production of real estate. And the stock itself, especially the stock, you don't. Maybe you get annual data on the uh, U.S. Uh, on the stock of U.S. real estate, residential real estate, for instance. That's I I don't know whether the Bureau of Statistics publishes monthly data, but I'm quite sure they don't. Yeah. But um, yeah, long story short, I think it's it is uh, the criticism is fair um, because the stock to flow ratio itself is highly dependent on a second factor which is halvings maybe it's just time time uh, time since genesis or blocks since genesis that is more important so the first block being mined being the genesis block which was in january 3rd 2009 for bitcoin so this time it's maybe more important because that determines when the halving comes right and therefore, yeah, criticism is fair, enough. but nonetheless, I think it's very, it's a very easy and well, uh, well to be understood representation of an equilibrium price model. And there are many equilibrium price models, right? Um, but so talking about seasonal patterns. So when we talk about seasonal patterns, the, the previous one was about the cycle drawdowns, but um, the bull markets itself, and we've talked a lot about halvings, right? And these halvings tend to in, induce bull markets, right? The, at least that's what the post-halving performance suggests. So I think I, I mentioned it yesterday, Dominic, in the other presentation, uh, the average is 33x. So you tend to do 33x on average, um, after the halving, that, that's, that's the historical empirical record, basically. This yeah, is but... uh, the, the, the median of the past cycles, and these grayish areas are the max and min values. And the yellow line is the current cycle. So the key takeaway here is basically, yes, we, have, we had this uh, normal pattern of post-halving outperformance in Bitcoin bull market. We had the bear market, which is also very consistent with previous cycles. And now we tend to, uh, at least the market tends to um, price in the halving already, the coming halving, which is due in around a year by now, in April uh, 2024. So that's the key takeaway. And talking about seasonal patterns, so... Um, when we talk about seasonality, and this is basically the seasonal pattern throughout the whole year, independent of halvings or anything. When we just look at the whole year, 
So that's the January 1st here, day zero, basically. And this is December 31st, end of the year. Then this is the seasonal pattern since um, 2011 until 2022. So all the data we basically have available. And the gray areas are, again, the max and mean values. So we have been following the average quite closely. And what the average suggests from the past is um, that we tend to, uh, that we continue to rally at least until July. And then there's some kind of summer low. Maybe people go on holidays, even for Bitcoin, it's relevant. And yeah, you have this kind of people sideways. On, on boating trips to lose their, <laughs> on boating, uh, to lose their yes. Bitcoin. <laughs> on occasional boating accidents. <laughs> And um, yeah, you tend to see some kind of sideways market usually. And then uh, um, towards the end of the year, you tend to see a new kind of rally with new highs on average. But that's the seasonal pattern. And if we drill down on the specific timeframes, it's actually quite interesting. So, I mean, the, the webinar is called fell in May and go away. I mean, it is associated with the Wall Street proverb, but I actually looked up the history of that, of that saying because um, yeah, it, it tends to come back every year. Yeah, people and investors in the in the traditional financial um, world, they, they tend to say it every year, sell in May and go away. But the origins actually, it dates back to uh, the 18th century. And the original saying was, fell in May and go away and come back on St. Ledger's Day. It's not the ledger that you're thinking of, the hardware wallet. <laughs> so St. Ledger's Day is referring to a horse race in England. Now, what does a horse race have to do with the stock market? But the original idea was that um, that saying recommended British investors, aristocrats, bankers should sell their shares in May, relax and enjoy the summer months yeah, while escaping the London heat and return to the stock market in autumn after that St. Ledger stakes, which is a horse race in September. Yeah, and US investors, they, over time, of course, they have um, adopted this uh, kind of saying, this uh, um, proverb on Wall Street, and they tend to, uh, they continue to say this, like sell on Memorial Day in May and come back on Labor Day in September, basically, right? And I found it super interesting to see that very same performance pattern for Bitcoin, actually for crypto assets. So this is the monthly average performance um, since August 2010 for Bitcoin, since we have available data basically for Bitcoin. And you tend to see yeah, high performance, especially in April, October, November, um, above average performance also in May. So this month is also quite good. Uh, it's the fourth best month on average for Bitcoin. But then you see some kind of, yeah, summer holiday effect, just like in the traditional stock market, which is quite interesting. And especially August and September, are on average at least, they have been the worst month uh, performance-wise. But then there's some kind of yeah, year-end rally, just like in the traditional fina uh, financial world in the stock market, which I found personally super interesting. So human routine can, appears to have some kind of effect on crypto assets that are being traded 24-7, 365. But yeah, and these um, performance patterns or yeah, the, the idea that performance patterns are actually... Um, uh, influenced by human routine is actually also shown in the daily data. So Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and also Fridays tend to be above average returns, but weekends especially, like Saturday, Sunday, are below average, which suggests less liquidity, less volume, less price action on average as well. And same for hourly data. You tend to have below average return. So if we take the um, averages of the Asian session and compare to the London session or the New York session, which, which happens later in the day, 
you have below average returns in Asia, but average and above average returns in London and New York, which is quite interesting. And you have the same pattern for in the FX market, in the traditional financial world. But it's really interesting to see this uh, for crypto as and especially Bitcoin in this case as well. But, so there's some evidence on a monthly, daily, and even hourly basis that human routine has some kind of significant effect on the performance patterns for crypto assets, despite the fact that it's being trading traded 24-7, 365. Yeah. Maybe you have something to add. <laughs> I don't know. I found this really interesting. No, uh, I mean, all, all good. I mean, you, you mentioned it uh, before, I think. Um, even though crypto trades 24-7, you see uh, you see patterns that people step away from from mm -hmm. their machines on the weekends, wherever they are, um, even though it's it's a globally traded asset 24-7, um, but volumes on exchanges are significantly lower on, on the weekends. Uh, I don't know if you've checked um, whether whether then price movements on the weekends are more uh they are volatile to either side or, or mm. if that's or if volatility that's still... yeah. yeah that would be the next project then <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's take it away yeah. yeah but i think that's pretty much wraps up our um, key content for today so we've talked about the big picture and um as i've mentioned despite the rally uh, this year of 80%, now it's more like 60% year to date, but we had, uh, until the recent correction, we had 80% for Bitcoin. Uh, sentiment, neither sentiment nor valuations so, show any kind of exuberance, right? And um, we think the bottom is likely behind us. I've shown you that probability models um, before, and the market is actually following the previous cycles um, performance in terms of the bear market and tends to start or continue uh, tends to start pricing in the next halving, which is scheduled for April 2024. So that's the big picture basically. And then we ask the question, sell in May and go away. I told uh, I told you the story, which is really weird. It's been around since the uh, 18th century and it's act there. Uh, it was a uh, um, essentially developed by British investors and taken over by or adapted by um, US investors and still uh, alive and well today. But you tend to see these kind of performance patterns on a monthly, daily, hourly basis, also for crypto assets, in particular Bitcoin. And it suggests that yeah, human routines plays a role also for, for crypto assets that are being traded 24-7. And may so we and May at the moment um, shows above average returns and also April, um, um, October and November. So there's also some kind of evidence for a year end rally. And this is also the, the uh, sorry, the key takeaway for the, for the different time frames. So on an hourly basis, you should favor the London New York session. So if you're day trading crypto assets, <laughs> then, then you should maybe buy buy the dips in the Asian session and hold uh, through the London and New York session where you tend to experience above average returns. And on a daily basis, um, you should favor start of the weeks versus weekend. And I also found this interesting because there's also the turnaround Tuesday. Maybe you've heard of this but it's also like a significant effect in the stock market. So in traditional financial world, we have above average returns on Tuesday, especially if Monday was negative. That's a, that's a different story, maybe. Okay. <laughs> For turn on Tuesday. Um, yeah, but yeah, maybe to, to just, just to, to uh, wrap it up. So monthly... Yeah, you should favor months outside of the holiday season. And again, this also suggests some kind of influence of human routine on crypto asset prices. Yeah, but that's it. So Dominic, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say one thing, um, because I think we didn't touch actually on 
on a point that you you mentioned in your first bullet, the the big picture, uh, where the macro. macro also yes. provides tailwind. Let's. Uh, I mean, I don't know if um, if we scheduled this for for an hour or, or 45 minutes or 30 minutes, but I I just quickly like to talk about what happened on the macro side in. Uh, or since we last talked, and uh, why do you think it will provide or has the potential to provide tailwind for, for crypto assets? Yeah, it's a great point. I didn't bring it up because focus was rather seasonality, but of, of course, macro is super important. So when we talk about the US economy, I think the latest, most important data points were your CPI and initial claims. So CPI underwhelmed to the downside, which is good. So um, inflation data came down more than expected, uh, which always provides some kind of uh, rationale for the Fed to ease. So it's always a uh, net positive. Um, and the second data point was the initial claims. And they came uh, uh, way above expectations. I think they came in above every single economist's expectation for that, uh, for that data point, right? So this is also bearish when you consider monetary policy because a worsening labor market and initial unemployment claims suggest a worsening labor market is actually another rationale beside the inflation data yeah, to ease or actually pause tightening monetary policy. But nonetheless, I think um, the market has still been under pressure because yields have been rising because after the May rate hike, because uh, the Fed or, uh, delivered another rate hike despite the banking crisis, right? In May, they, they, they hiked uh, 25 basis points again. And some Fed economists, they came out and said, yeah, we could imagine another rate hike in June <laughs> despite the banking crisis and everything that's going on. But I think the consensus has been shifting from no landing or soft landing to rather hard landing because of the banking crisis in the meantime. Because um, I think the senior loan officer opinion survey is very, very special data point, but there's a quarterly survey um, where bank managers and credit managers are asked uh, by the Fed on their credit lending, so bank lending conditions from the demand side and supply side. And it implies that credit conditions have been tightening Right, it makes sense. So if you have banking crisis, usually banks become more risk averse, they hold back uh, loans, and it usually leads to some kind of um, yeah credit contraction. And we've seen credit contraction in the data. And considering that we've already been on a slowdown path, it, it's so much, at, at least in my point of view, is so much increases the probability of recession. I think. That's basically consensus by now. And I also, I've seen the latest surveys, I think 65% of economists, they expect in US recession, it's basically baked in the cake. It's not like a super outsider call anymore. And um, yeah, question is still when the Fed will acknowledge this, right? Uh, and maybe the initial claims will provide enough fodder, fodder for the Fed to at least pause hike, uh, hiking uh, and tightening on the policy. But I think the market will eventually yeah, anticipate this. And the market already expects 100 basis points cuts until year end. So four cuts basically are already priced in into the curve, into the yield curve. And therefore, I think it will become even more because credit is contracting. You have to have this uh, banking stress that will yeah, even accelerate this credit contraction. You have the problems in the housing market, which are usually very leading very early in the cycle. Initial claims start to spike, and therefore I think the trend is, or it's quite likely that we go into a recession and the Fed, uh, that unemployment will spike and that the Fed will eventually have to pivot or at least pause, and then markets will continue to rally. And that from a, a financial condition point of view, I think that's bullish for Bitcoin and crypto assets because um, Bitcoin and crypto assets are not only an antithesis to the fiat money system, which 
creates money out of thin air and theoretically unlimited money supply, right? And we have limited coin supply on the other hand. But um, the dollar, I mean, the dollar is bound to weaken because if the Fed starts to pivot or um, yeah, telegraphs a pause and especially easing cycle, dollar will weaken. And I think in the last crypto market intelligence report, we've um, also shown that bar chart again, where Bitcoin performance has been highest in periods where dollar has appreciated, depreciated the most. So dollar weakness is basically super bullish for crypto assets in a particular Bitcoin. And therefore, yeah, that will provide a tailwind from the macro side. Yeah, I mean, dollar yeah. has already come down substantially, right? Since yeah, yeah. The, yeah, September 2022, just looking at the Dixie index. Also, yeah. uh, regional bank performance since the beginning of the year, or S&P uh, regional banking. Um, I, I, I continue to see this chart that there's um, like a um, deposit drain at US banks in, in slow motion, basically, where every mm -hmm. week depositors withdraw billions and billions of dollars, um, which puts further stress onto maybe already weakly capitalized banks, I don't know. Mm. And the, the funny thing is, I don't know whether you've seen this, Apple has been competing with banks as well. Yeah, yeah. They've recently launched their banking service and, and deposit service, um, offering um, yields, I think, rates in, in excess of 4%, right? Yeah. Which is very much higher still than banks offer, are offering on average in the US. I think banks are offering like one to 2% still at the moment, despite this deposit flight. And yeah, you have this deposit flight into money market funds, which are offering like four to 5% on average. And then Apple comes out and says, look, we have, we have a deposit service too, where you can yeah. deposit your money for an excess of 4%, which is quite crazy. So. I think the the banks, especially re regional banks, are squeezed from all kinds of angles at the moment. But um, talking about the um, U.S. government and U.S. debt situation as well, I mean, uh, the the problem of the debt ceiling is still not on the table, right? Yeah, CDS prices, the the road. yeah, it's it's it, they are kicking the can down the road. I mean, the usual path in the past has been. They, they will probably deliver a super last minute increase in the debt limit. The worst case is probably they will shut down government services. They will close down museums for a couple of weeks to save money, right? But eventually there will be some kind of agreement when push comes to shove and they, I mean, that has been the, the case, the, the most extreme case in, in in the past, right? I think 2011. But nonetheless, I mean, CDS prices, so credit default swap prices, they have they have um, plateaued. They they don't increase anymore. At least one year CDS for U.S. government uh, debt. So I think the US, the CDS market's pricing in a default of like 2.6 percent in one year, which is not quite low, but it has been increasing very fast, right? And I've looked at the recent um, treasury general treasury general account data at the Fed TGA data, and they only have eighty six billion dollars left, and they have a burn rate of around thirty or forty. I think not only per per week, it's per day, so they have only a couple of days left. It's quite quite insane actually, but. Um, yeah, I think Goldman, they came out a month ago and they said early June latest where you can ex expect the money, uh, where you can expect the treasury to run out of cash. But I mean, even if they come to an agreement, let's say they come to an agreement, everything is fine. They're kicking the can down the road just again, right? But I mean, that's the end end game. Eventually, they will go for a soft default because interest payments. I've 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 seen the latest numbers are already one trillion U.S. dollars per quarter. You know, you have 
31.5 trillion dollars in US total national debt, which is 130% of GDP. And interest debt payments are like so high, one yeah. trillion per quarter. And they have short maturities. The maturity profile of US government bonds is not like 10 years on average, it's two years, super yeah. short termish. So yeah. when, when they roll over the debt in the coming two years, Become they have to roll expensive. over 31 point or at least a very large sum or very large proportion of their total debt they will have to roll over and refinance in the coming years and they will lock in the very high interest rates yeah and and, and who's the the marginal buyer of uh, yes. US debt i don't know uh, i i don't have any uh, any numbers ready how recent treasury auctions have have gone down but um mm. who's who's buying the treasuries of the margin right uh china <laughs> russia <laughs> which have like saudi arabia which have been historically large buyers of of treasuries um mm. they are not buying so much anymore um and yes. i mean not not rooting this whole de-dollarization uh thing i think we can we could discuss hours about it um but Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's rooting for that, right? Uh, but e eventually something will break and uh, the Fed has to react. And I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. about what's good for crypto assets here. And yeah, and because uh, it, it eventually it implies some kind of soft default. So yeah. even if they don't do a technical default, hard default, in terms they don't pay their debt, don't pay coupons or maturities, then they will opt for a soft default, which is inflation, hyperinflation in the extreme case, right? Because they will have to resort to some kind of yield con curve control, some kind of interest rate control monetary policy for the debt not to explode. But at the same time, they will have to let inflation run in order to devalue the debt on in normal terms. Yeah. That's the only option. And high inflation is good for crypto, it's good for Bitcoin because it's scarce. And yeah, the structural case is super bullish. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me back to, uh, to our legal uh, disclaimer <laughs> no investment <laughs> advice. But uh, I mean, yeah, where where everything is going on a on a global basis, uh, and then specifically looking at how how the ECB is reacting to certain things, how how the Fed is reacting, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah it looks looks like um, a interesting years ahead at least. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say, yeah, definitely, and also 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 think that the current macro cycle, so considering that we are probably um, at the cusp of a new easing cycle, monetary policy easing cycle and a new economic cycle because growth is at the bottom, we're probably in a recession right now. So it's all, all accelerating both from a global growth perspective, which also should be a tailwind for risky assets and also crypto assets in general. And from a monetary policy perspective, right? We are super tight, but we're probably going to ease from here. So the, the probability of more tightening is rather low compared to super much potential for very high potential for easing, right? And therefore yeah. I think that could even challenge the halving cycle. So because halving is uh, still uh, around a year um, away in April, 2024, and before that, you could have this complete reversal in both global growth expectation and policy expectation, which could be super tailwind for yeah. crypto assets. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I mean, That's, yeah. if there's no no questions from our participants, then I would say thanks for your time, Andre. Um, for putting the slides together for, for presenting. Um, as always, super insightful. Um, yeah. Oh, 
this pretty much wraps it up and well, in case yeah in case if, if you have any questions uh, i've wrote it here in the in the headline ask us anything yeah you can reach out via email or linkedin you can dm us directly via linkedin as well if you have any kind of questions or remarks concerning the presentation or crypto market intelligence report or any kind of report in general yeah feel free to reach out and yeah hope you enjoyed this webcast and then hope to see you in the next one yeah thanks andre thanks everyone thanks. for participating and uh, talk to you soon bye, bye.